Hi everyone, welcome back to Wednesdays with Winton. My name is Madeline Gardner. I am the external comms manager at Jazz Lincoln Center. And thank you for once again joining us for our weekly Instagram Live with the one and only Winton Marcellus. So Winton will be joining us in just a moment. And before he hops on, I wanna remind you that once again, as you know, it is Wednesday. That means we're releasing another video from Jazz Lincoln Center's vault. Today, we released a, a video from the JLCO and Winton Marsalis celebrating all things Dizzy. So uh, this specific concert is a JLCO with Winton featuring percussionist Roman Diaz, vocalist Brandy Sutton, who dig deep into the musical world of Dizzy. So we, while we wait, Winton will be joining us in just a moment. Why don't you comment where you're uh, tuning in from and what your favorite Dizzy's tune is? And we'll get Winton on right now. Hi, Winston. What's going on? What you talking about, Maddie? What's happening? Yeah, we're, we're talking about uh, this wonderful concert we released from the ball today. First of all, looking sharp. You're looking great, Winston. Like oh, the suit. You. Thank you. All right. And we're talking about uh, the vault concert we released today, celebrating the great, great trumpeter Dizzy. So oh, could you, could you talk a little bit about this concert? And also, if you can uh, maybe tell us one piece of advice that Dizzy gave you that maybe you, you still think about today. I'm sure he gave you a lot, but. <laughs> Well, you know, the concert always trap people playing, trying to play with Dizzy and his music is so fantastic and he was great, so smart. I first met Dizzy, I was in high school. I was um, I was 14 and he was playing at a club in, in New Orleans called uh, Roses. It was a short lived club on Chapatula Street. And I went down to the club. My daddy said, man, you should come down and meet Dizzy. I, I, didn't, I knew who Dizzy was, but not really. Uh, I knew he was important, but I, I didn't know the music in that way. In the seventies, we listened mainly to Freddie Hubbard, mm -hmm. and you know, you you kind of knew Dizzy. So I went to I went to see him, and Dizzy said, "My daddy said, hey, Dizzy, this is my son. He's a trumpet player." And Dizzy looked at me and said, "Yeah." So he gave me his trumpet. He said, "Play something," but Dizzy had a mouthpiece that was very different from mine. <laughs> so I went to play it. I played. It was absolutely sad <laughs> when I played. Oh. I could barely get a sound out of this trumpet. So. He looked, at, he looked at me like he was trying to figure out what to say. He was like, <laughs> so he kept this. And then when he, when he looked, he looked up at my daddy. He looked back down at me and he said, practice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my so I love that. And then he took his horn back. He said, mm, give me my horn back. Because <laughs> if I was taking some style out of his horn, you know, he was like, man, give me, give me my horn. So uh, I, told, I told him that story made him laugh. Another time, I gave an interview. I don't know. I was, I think I was 19 years old or 20, somewhere in there, 20, 19, 20. Oh, I was just cursing and going off and talking like I didn't have any type of upbringing and saying how nobody couldn't play. <laughs> Man, all kind of stuff. So I saw Dizzy at the, at the Saratoga Jazz Festival. And he had a copy of the article in his case. <laughs> He pulled the article out. I started apologizing. Oh, man, Dizzy. You know, he said, no, 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 no. He said, there, there's a, he started pointing at it. He said, you, that's a lot of truth you told in there. He said, but be ready for the return. It might not ever stop. I didn't understand wow. what he meant. But I understood. another time he called me, we were in, um, we, we were in uh, playing the Playboy Jazz Festival. And it was 2 o'clock in the morning. He, and my phone rang. He was dizzy. He said, yeah, man, you up? It might have been 2.30. I said, yeah, man, you know, I'm up, of course. We started talking. He was like, he said he went to the ophthalmologist, and the ophthalmologist told him when he wanted to play low notes, look down. And when you want to play notes in the middle, look in the middle. And when you want to play high notes, look up high. I said, yeah. He said, you know, I asked Louis Armstrong one time what when he, when he was looking up in the sky, because Louis Armstrong always looked up when he played. He said, I asked him, I said, Pops, what are you looking for? And he said, Pops told him, I don't know, Brother Diz, but I always find it. So we start laughing. And uh, he said, yeah, man, it's something with them old folks knew how. And then he said, he hung up. <laughs> he said, good night. So, you know, many times, I mean, throughout, I asked Dizzy, I didn't want to, uh, I didn't know whether I wanted to go to Jazz and Lincoln Center and do like a big band and be involved with an organization and all of that. I would have my small band. We were playing. We were having a good time. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, man, I don't want to, you know, it's going to be, 
let alone you working now, you volunteering, you're not making your own money, you you like subject to everything that's going on. So I called Dizzy and I I asked him, man, you know, I got a dilemma. I wasn't really a big band person. I grew up playing small bands. What do you think? Should I deal with a big band or organization, institution, all this kind of dealing with people? He said, he said, he told me the story about his big band. Huh? You know, he wished he could have kept his band together and he had to make a choice between Lorraine, that's his wife, or the band. <laughs> See, he didn't have gigs, cats were staying around his house. And he said, he said, one should never consider it an achievement to lose one's orchestral tradition. Mm. So that stuck with me. Why? And I started thinking, why did we consider it to be an achievement to lose our orchestral music? And, I, and it made me understand just when you're being out thought a lot of times, you don't even realize you're being out thought, you know, and just how he looked at it. So that actually piece of advice is what made me decide to try to learn how to play big band music or to get into it and listen to more. It was really what Dizzy, what Dizzy told me. Mm -hmm. And I could go on and on just some things he, he, he would tell me about playing. He said, when you play in really fast tempos, tap your feet on one and three. There's another thing he would do this real hard thing with a kind of alternate fingerings. And he would, he showed me how if you play at a fast tempo, don't don't ever try to tap your feet on, on, on two and four. You know, if you're gonna tap your feet, go one, three. He showed me the difference between the two. And other other things, he loved to talk about the history and great trumpet players. He said he moved around the the corner from Louis Armstrong, he said, because he knew something like Louis Armstrong would never happen again. And he just wanted to be able to go to his house. Wow. And, uh, any, and uh, anything, too, about Duke Ellington's band, intellectual things about the music, transition, social things, Dizzy, yeah, he knew. He was, Dizzy was, he, he was, he was something funny, too. Mm. Just very, 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 uh, very knowledgeable about our instrument, all different trumpet players. And, and then for those of you tuning in right now, where we're talking about, uh, uh, the Great Dizzy, and specifically that we released today from a concert from Revolt. So it was from 2017 Rose Theater. I believe Vincent Gardner uh, was the music director for that. We had a lot of great people playing that gig. We had Brandy Sutton vocals, Roman Diaz. Uh, it, it was a, a really That's fantastic, right. really fantastic concert. So you can really view, that and view that entire concert on our YouTube page. Um, and we had, uh, if you could talk a little more about all the amazing people uh, in the band uh, as arrangers of Dizzy's music itself. What is it like to arrange a Dizzy's, Dizzy's music? And Russell Hall, of course, was on that gig as well. You know, we generally play Dizzy's arrangements or the arrangements that the arrangers uh, did of the music. Marcus Prentup did an arrangement of uh, Dizzy. Do -do -boop, be -do -boop, from uh, I can't, I can't, the, the name of the, of the pieces, Escaping Marcus did a did a great arrangement of it. It's off off of a. Uh, I can't remember right now, but it's most of the time if we do like like on that concert the kind of classic this because Dizzy was a great arranger too. Mm. Did a great arrangement of uh of of Round Midnight. Did a great arrangement of uh of the of uh what's, what's the kind of classic Dizzy with all kind of hip voices he put on stuff. Uh, the first arrangement he did for Woody Herman's band, I don't know what's wrong with my memory today. I've been been too many, too many things going on. But uh, when it's his arrangement, we play what he wrote. Mm. We, but and and then too with Gil Fuller, like with things to come. But in this, we did a uh, Gillespiana, Lalo Schifrin did, did that one. John Fass did a performance of that one time. I heard it was unbelievable. And uh, Cubana B, Cubana Bop. He also did some of, of uh, Chico Farrell's arrangements. So we do Chico's. You know, if we mm -hmm. do Manteca Suite, we do Chico's. So you're not going to arrange it better than him. So in general, we, we, don't, we don't try to rearrange things that are already masterpieces. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if it's small groups that, that does not have an arrangement, we'll do that. And with the band, we all have different arranging skills. With Vince's arrangements, it's always, when you look at it, you can't believe somebody wrote it. <laughs> always mm -hmm. on the trumpets on the third 16 note. A, a quarter, a third above the time on every third 16 note, going out with the mute. And it's, when you look at it, you think, man, is this? And then when he, you have to get him to sing it. And then when he sings it, it's written exactly right and it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Because Vince has a very unusual sense of the layers of time. In addition to being very sophisticated in his pen and writing a lot of, 
of hocketed parts and kind of bell tone parts and the complicated ways that they fit together. He also, anything that uses Afro-Cuban rhythms, Afro-Caribbean rhythms, things that have a, like any boogaloo kind of funk grooves, things, he understands the, the gaps between that and how to make an arrangement work. Mm. And uh, he, he's always very inventive as an arranger, but we always save his arrangement for last in rehearsal because we know that's going to be the most. <laughs> we have to do some work on it because he's going to write some complicated parts for us. Mm. And, and talking about arranging uh, and, and paying, you know, uh, tribute and honor to, to the greats, a great week for, for Trumpeters, the JLCO also put out uh, Walkin, Miles Davis's right. Walkin. Right. We could talk a little right. bit about that. It was another virtual collaboration. Marcus did it. Marcus did the arrangement, and uh, we wanted to get it out for Miles's birthday. But then we got so many things coming with e with EE. E. Mm -hmm. We did it, but then we we just held it, and then we put it out. And Marcus did it, and and both Bo, let me see Ryan and I were left. That's not the kind of stuff we like. I don't like to do that kind of stuff, like four trumpets and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and Ryan, we we both, but it was he did a really good job on it. You know, we just did. We were Marcus hits. Marcus, he, he, he has such honesty about the stuff that he does. And he's such a, uh, he comes at everything with a, with a great deal of honesty and humility. Mm. And it's, it's in his, his upbringing. He also is very original in his playing. So he took Miles' solo on Straight No Chase, I think, and he put it inside of Walker. There's two blueses in F. And uh, he wrote some harmony, some unison. And uh, Marcus made it happen. You know? So he wrote it. He was like, hey, man, let's do this. And uh, we we love do we love him we love doing it Kenny, all of us we love Marcus he's so collegial and we've been playing together in Trump section for such a long time, and he's also a person with he has tremendous range. Mm. Uh, he can play New Orleans music. He can play any type of music with grooves on it. He can play uh, modern music. He can play longer rhythms on fast pieces. He has a lot of endurance, and he's very hard working on stuff like you very exposed parts that are difficult to take a lot, a lot of weight of sound. I remember Doug Wamble wrote a piece and Marcus played like a preacher on it. It's just unbelievable kind of feeling he played with uh, based on Stuart Davis's uh, piece. Stuart Davis for the masses, Doug's piece is called. And mm -hmm. Marcus, Mar yeah, Marcus is something. So, and, and you know, of course, Miles goes without saying. F funny thing, Miles, Miles told me once he said that he, he said, he said that everything he was playing in the early years was dizzy, slowed down. He said, if you listen to the record, um, if you listen to the record Milestones, I think he, was, he, was, he said Milestones, uh, on one of the first Columbia, around midnight, he said, if you listen to that record, that's all dizzy. Ain't nothing but dizzy, slow down. That's the way he would say it. He loved dizzy. Now all the musicians loved dizzy, was also like a teacher. Hmm. So dizzy, dizzy was a teacher, he was a great dancer, he was funny, he, he could play, the music, he took care of people. People come stay at his, 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 his apartment and, and aggravate Lorraine to death. And uh, of course, he's an innovator, great soloist, individual stylist on the trumpet. You can't, when, when I first heard Dizzy, I couldn't believe anybody could play like that. And then just the fact to me that John Faddis had, 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 had the courage to try to play anything Dizzy played. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the fantastic way that John plays, influenced by Dizzy, Roy Eldridge, all of us, you know, with the people we like, I learned another whole thing about trumpet playing when I heard John Faddis play. Because mm. when you listen to Dizzy, you think, man, you know, it's not even worth trying to play. I remember my daddy played me a record of Diz. I was like, man, Sunny Side of the Street or something with him and Sonny Stead. And I was, man, nobody can play like this guy. And, and on that note, too, I see a lot of people comment often, you know, when you hear these greats play and you listen to these, you know, you, you aspire to be like them and you listen, you're inspired by them. How do you use that to inspire you rather than to be like, oh, I'll never play like that. I can't play like that. How do you carry that? And what would be your advice for? for you you know, that, that's a question of life that we all, and we all have experienced it. It could be sitting in a math class. It could not have anything to do with music. Mm. You could be in a class with another person your age and they just stuff that you struggle with. They just get so natural. It could be playing ball. Somebody's a natural athlete and you want. I mean, our lives are about uh, making adjustments and having heroes and people that we, what you, what you hope is you don't have to, uh, you can still keep the things you like as a person becomes less of a hero to you. Mm. Like I had a very spotty relationship with Miles, but still the depth of his playing and the impact it had on me as a trumpet player from listening to Someday My Prince Will Come and all these kind of great records. 
even when I became very tested with him and, you know, and he say stuff about me, I would say stuff about him. And I didn't feel the same kind of love I had for him personally. Still, his trumpet playing. Whew. I mean, you got to respect, even at this age now, you put on, put on one of like funny Valentine in concert, you have to respect mm. just the, the depth of the playing. And sometimes when you're younger and you're trying to find your own personality, you think you have to get into an adversarial relationship with people you admire. You don't have to because they're not going to, they're not going to stop you from finding what you found. Mm. So I, I tend to believe everybody has their own personality and uh, it's easy for you to find yourself because you already are you. Like we're talking about right. Marcus Printer, he always had a very unique original way of playing. You could put 400 trumpet players on, you're going to know Marcus Printer. Mm. The first four or five notes you know, this Marcus Printer is playing. And uh, I think, you know, when you're younger, 20, 19, 21, 24, 23, in those years that you're trying to develop your playing, it's a little later now. I mean, it was a little later in my generation. I don't know about now, but because it was few of us playing. Whereas then Miles was 18 or 16 or something. He knew Dizzy. He was, you know, it was already, he was younger. Uh, and he was trying to imitate Bird when he was 17 or 18. Whereas for us, we're playing more funk tunes and stuff that didn't have figures like that. These are people who won, won records a, a long time ago. Many times when I was 17, 18, if you would go to hear great jazz musicians, they were trying to play funk tunes like us and sounding worse. Like, mm. most of them, nothing worse than that early jazz funk. Like, they wasn't really funky. If you was actually playing in a funk band, they was listening to that and thought, mm, okay, this is okay. Whereas if you were Miles and you were listening to Dizzy and you were 16 and he was 20, whatever, you were thinking, mm. damn, I'm, I need to go practice, you know? Yep. So these, these things are generational. It depends on the generation and the listenership and all this. These things are, are kind of a little more complicated to come to conclusions but one thing is for sure regardless of the age or time younger people is always a challenge to kind of negotiate your relationship with people that you respect whether they're your age or not if they're your age you call it jealousy if they're older mm. than you you call it something else right and i always say that we all have things we can do that other people cannot do mm. and it's important to find the things you do and celebrate those things while you celebrate the things that you learn from others that's a great piece of advice, something I have to always kind of remind myself. And, and as you speak about personality, you know, a lot of people ha say that every instrument has a personality, uh, <laughs> you know, attached to it. What would you say is the personality of a trumpet player? Come on, now, we, we, everybody knows we the lion. We blew down the walls of Jericho, our elephant trumpets. You know, the first person with leg bone, you're going in the war, a trumpet player start playing. Instead of, instead of the trumpets blew the... Archangel Gabrielle, she blew the trumpet and the world started. And when it ends, she's going to play it again. I mean, we, we're the ball. We're trumpets. You know, you can't temper us. Hmm. We're brash. We have an arrogant personality. I mean, it's been some really sweet trumpet players. But, you know, in general, our personality, you know, we always one group. Ra raising can in the band is always a problem. The trumpet on the percussion section. We're always playing loud and abusing people. You know, we, we are hard-headed. But you know, you, you you tell it, you tell it how it is. What about other instruments? What about the what about like a uh, the bass? I know you always say the bass is at the heart. Bass, the, the bass is wise. There was a lot of wisdom in the bass. Boom, 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 boom. The bass is down in the bottom. The judge, Milt Hinton, was called a judge. The bass player can hear everything from the bottom. It's the foundation. So mm -hmm. bass players tend to have like a lot of gravitas and intellectualism, and they're always figuring things out because they're the bottom of the harmony, and they. They know what's going on and they have to adjust. So they play in the rhythm section, they undergird things, they play a lower melody. They have to constantly adjust on every beat to a drummer playing above them that's generally louder than them. Yeah, bass players are very, very humane, intelligent. Rufus Reed, you know, Ron Carter, very intelligent. Rodney Whitaker, intelligent. Carlos Enriquez, very humane, intelligent. Gets go through the list of people. Reginald Veal, intelligent. Ben Wolf. Interested in a lot of stuff, write a lot of interested in music, bass. Do you do you find that when you meet young musicians, especially? Well, I want to say congratulations with EE. E. EE e. was absolutely yeah. incredible. For those who don't know, um, we held our first ever uh, virtual international, essentially Ellington uh, festival, celebrating 25 years of essentially Ellington, which you can actually head to jazz.org/ee25 and watch. Uh, all the amazing 12 virtual events that uh, we put on. 
And when you when you talk to a lot of these uh, uh, young students, you do you find that you kind of see you can before you know what they're playing. Do you sometimes know what 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 they're what they're gonna be playing based on the personality trait? Sometimes I guess them. I was a little better earlier. Now I'm getting a little rusty. <laughs> but I always try to guess you play in a rhythm section, you know, mm. you do your perfect pitch. Sometimes I can look at their hands and tell whether they have perfect pitch. Mm. I got, I'm, my success rate is kind of high. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can kind of, trumpet players almost always know. Yeah. Sometimes the will win players, yeah, everybody has a little, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not 100%, but I'm, I'm in the good 70s. Well, well, and on that note of, of EE as well, um, obviously, this year was a little different because we weren't able to hold the celebration in the hall. But, you know, we, a lot of really amazing feedback online, people really thankful that we, we put it on. What was, was there any takeaway from you doing this virtually? Obviously, ideally, we'd be doing this in, in person. But what was the biggest takeaway and why education, music education, whether we're in a pandemic or not, is so essential? Well, just... um. You know, the, the tapes that were sent in of the musicians were sent in earlier. So the bands are not as used to playing the music as they normally are at this time. Mm. But my main takeaway is that it's, it's a lot you can't get unless you're in person with them. You know, I always like teasing them and hearing them play. And I mean, it's very different at home, listening to everybody. I could spotlight more on what the bands were playing and give more detailed comments to the band directors on an earlier tape. Mm. And just you get to see kids and uh you get to see a lot about what's going on in the world. I, I like the fact that we had international bands, but you can also see kind of the segregation of America in that, in the bands, the way it's laid out. I see a lot. And because mm -hmm. I'm so dedicated to the band directors and to the bands and to the students and have been for so many years, as was my father and many of the fathers of, of, of different band directors. Um, I mean, my heart always goes out to the kids when they're playing and I grew up playing in bands and you know, we have a, we have a, a great deal of mutuality. I also love this year just my, my alumni and just how, how good they all are and also their level of engagement and humanity. Mm. And, um, yeah, I was, I, I was proud of that, of, of them and hearing them talk and Alexa talking, Riley being a judge and, you know, every, everything, everything. It's, 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 a, it's a, of course, the music of Duke. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's a, there's a lot involved with it. And, and if anyone tuning in right now, as, as I mentioned before, you can go ahead and go to jazz.org slash EE25 to watch uh, all of the virtual events that were involved with that. International bands, 23 big bands from uh, across the world joined in on that. And I wanted to also bring up one more thing. Keep, uh, please, everyone, keep on uh, asking any questions down there so we can give those to Winton. You talked about um, AL, MLK's final speech at the National Cathedral during Skane's Domain that he delivered in 1968 and how it's still relevant now. Could you speak a little bit, maybe if any viewers right now were not tuning into Skane's Domain, can you speak a bit about that? Well, you got to just listen to it because mm -hmm. nobody is like him. You know, it's, 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 he's so clear and this is the end of his life. And he's just talking about wealth disparity and he's talking about problems we have and how we have to expend intellectual energy on solving those problems then letting the problem you expend it on be something that's not germane to your immediate environment. And he identified the global struggle that goes on. A lot of things that we talk about now, you're going to see how clear he was in his insight of how things were going. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, whenever you start to get groups of generations around, it's important too, because he was still a young man. I mean, he got, he was young when he died, when he got assassinated. Mm. And, uh, and, and I tie that in, in, in a lot of ways, to all the things that's going on, even with something like EE, because people are playing Duke Ellington's music. Like with MLK, some people just their level of dedication and they're very succinct in their, in their understanding. And the more we all encounter that and think about it and consider it, the more we, the, the, the more accomplished we can be as, as citizens and as people. Mm. And um, I think that's, a, that's another thing I, I, I liked about EE uh, is a, uh, with MLK, I thought about just when I see him go up, all of the people who are in the cathedral, and I thought about it, all his support system and the SELC and all the people he was talking about and everybody who made his ascendance possible, even Lyndon Johnson, everything that was a part of his world. We tend to want to break things down to a component part and say, well, this is why, or the, this one person is why, but it's never, it's never a person. Like, that's what Dizzy was always saying. I know I was thinking about something. When Dizzy would talk, he always put you in the world of everybody else. 
he called me to say about Louis Armstrong. He would talk about Miles or oh, Charlie Parker. One time, Dizzy told me we we, we were at his house listening to some music. And, and they were playing something. He put on a record, early record of him playing with Bird. And he looked at me and he said, he said, it's some deep notes came out of Charlie Parker's horn. It ain't on a record. <laughs> he said, it ain't, it ain't on a record. He said, sometimes you stand next to him and the notes that will come out of him will be so deep. You would just look over at him like, this is coming out of a person. Mm -hmm. And I think with MLK, a lot of what he's saying, it's good for us to always return to our fundamentals. Um, in, in this case, MLK, in the arts, there are many fundamentals that we have to always return to uh, in, in, in America. That's why I like to return to the actual words of Abraham Lincoln, the actual words of Frederick Douglass, the actual art of Winslow Homer, the actual art of Duke Ellington. Not, I heard this, uh, you know, the art of Walt Whitman. You go to these people's art itself and you start to refer to it and check in with it and you start to realize, okay, People have been thinking about stuff for a long time. Mm. As, as you've said in, in many of these episodes, you know, if you like, if you want to learn, if you want to know more, go to the people themselves. Listen, you know, read their their words, listen to their music, and then go, yeah. go to the source. Time. Go mm. to the go to the source. Dizzy's great book to be or not to buy. Fantastic information in there. To be what was that title? To, to be or not to, be, to, not to Yeah, a lot of information, a lot of people, big world. Mm. That's also just a great title of a book. Right. Um, so we have a, a couple more questions here. Who are some musicians, composers you listen to that influence your classical trumpet playing? You know, all of the, the all of the uh, musicians that wrote that. I mean, I listen to a lot of classical music, so they, it's not if I'm. I don't play classical trumpet that much. I'm almost. I, I never really play now, but. I love the music, so I'll listen to you take your pick of the of the it can it can be everything from John Adams to Ellen Zwillick to I mean I, I it's, it's a lot of been a lot of composers who left contemporary composers left a lot for us mm. uh of course all the trumpet literature we have a lot of great modern literature and, and other other things. Uh, that, that I love and grew up, grew up listening to and still listen to. Now, you know, I like Shostakovich a lot. When I, when I was growing up, I always liked him. He writes great trumpet parts. Of course, trumpet players like Shostakovich. Uh, first piece I played in high school was Shostakovich Piano Concerto. Uh, it's like a double turn. So we practiced that a lot. But I began to listen to his music. He, he Just the clarity of his music and all the pressure he was under, I think, in this time, I've been I listen to him and check him out and, and, and think about where he's coming from. Mm. Um, his, his, his skill as, a, as, as an orchestrator and his ability to convey how colorful he is in an unconventional way. Well, he's coming from that whole school where Rimsky, Korsakov, and Stravinsky and the kind of down that line, Glazunov, all the kind of great Russian uh, composers and colorists. But uh, you could turn anywhere you want. You're going to find... You could turn it to the, the French school. It's a good French school of trumpet playing. Roger Voisin was it was in a, still alive at Tanglewood when I went. So that kind of school up in Boston at, at that time. Um, th this goes on and on. Endless. I mean, I can only imagine that you are continue to be inspired as you hear. You know, re-listen to to things that you've listened to before that might sound differently now at this point. You Definitely. know. Definitely. You know, my favorite composer, of course, was always Beethoven, like everybody else's. Mm. But Bach for the trumpet parts and also just for foundational harmony, analyzing those chorales and, uh, and classical music. And, 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 and you know, in the, in the American tradition, it's built on that tradition. So mm. when you get to the American composers like, 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 like Duke Ellington, like Gertrude, like Jelly Roll Martin, who have a different a way of, of developing material, but the foundation of harmony and all that is the same, just with some blues added and a certain type of, uh, a certain, for lack of a better term, certain type of Africanism. But that Africanism is in the root of the philosophy. Mm. A lot of times when I say, oh, African rhythm, it's not African rhythm. It, it is a certain rhythmic perspective. But in African, in, in, uh, in a certain form of African traditional music, they play in a six rhythm and a four rhythm at the same time. Western music, we almost never do that. We'll swing because our harmony is always in four. 
Migas hinted on it with some of the things he did. And Miles' second rhythm section with Herbie and, and Tony on records like Live the Plug Nickel. Sometimes they go a third above the time and they do these types of things. But the real Africanism in the music is the belief, is, is, is a belief that you can create a new moment through ritual. And that's fundamentally different from the Western thought. The Western thought is not ritual, ritualized. It's the thought that the, that the art has a forward motion that is powerful because someone innovates a particular thing that identifies them and people imitate them. And the African concept in a generic way, of course, a lot of, a lot of African music, a lot of places, it covers a lot of meaning generically. If you have to reduce it, as, as in how you're reducing European, it's a lot of people, goes without saying, is the, is the belief that there is a timelessness to something in the core of the ebb and flow of the music. So those two concepts, they work together, but jazz musicians figured out how they work together, but the critical establishment never figured that out because they didn't know that about African music. Mm. That's truly, it's really fascinating. And also yeah. it's, it's interesting to, to go back to also brings it all back to Dizzy. I mean, specifically this, this concert, Vincent's talking in the beginning and he says, I, I, this quote, you know, as much uh, a revolution as was a movement, bebop ushered in a modern era of jazz and marked, you know, a decisive line between the old and the new. So it's kind of also like the, it can all kind of go back to, you know, things are always yeah. happening, but there's. Yeah, and for, for me, that's one of the cornerstones of my refutation. Like I, that's, that is the thing that for, for, for me always, where I have like a, a riff, not me and Vincent, I mean, it just, he was saying what it is to people, is I don't believe in that way of looking at the history of things. Mm. Because when you heard Dizzy talk about Louis Armstrong, he never condescended to Pops. <laughs> he never said, well, Louis Armstrong, that was a nice old style. Or he always said, man, you know, you hear Pops play. He didn't refer to Duke Ellington as, older music or that was something that was old he would say he, his vibe was always man duke you couldn't figure out what he was playing mm. and uh indeed that wasn't the way he lived and the way he was in relation to other musicians so sometimes you get a certain type of of, of western philosophy this uh applied to music that's too light for what jazz actually is mm. i i think that is a, a on that note a great way to kind of think about that sit on that and to to Right. Maybe, maybe like, you know, the, the ways to not unlearn ways that we've been programmed, but to see the bigger picture of things, right. which is... It, right. It's a continuum. Mm -hmm. It's a continuum. You know, you, 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 you're born midstream. Mm. It was going, it was flowing, and it's going to flow when you're gone. And, and what, 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 are, what will we do to, to continue that history and make, you know... We're continuing it. We're continuing it right now today. That's right. Whatever we do continues it. Whatever we do. We don't, you know... The, Freddie Hubbard didn't have to be great as Louis Armstrong, or Louis Armstrong didn't have to be as great as Francis Johnson. Or it's a continuum. It flows mm -hmm. through, and we are all a part of the fabric of it. And we all have different achievements and different insights. And uh, the more you know about different things, you start to put them together. And now you think no matter what, how much you study, how much you know, you still will only ever know a very teeny fraction of what there is to be known. Mm. Well, well, thank you as always for these thank amazing you. talks. You always, I always, I feel like I personally so always come away think, really thinking about everything and I see things differently every time. So thank you for taking right. time to, to talk to, to all of us here. And, and before I hit it back to Winton here, before uh, we wrap up, I want to thank everyone so much for tuning in. Uh, once again, you can head to jazz.org. We have a weekly schedule of amazing things, seven days a week. We have master classes. We have live concerts uh, streaming from artists' home. We have educational uh, uh, master classes, a little bit of everything for everyone. So thank you for tuning in. And Winton, thank you again. And if you want to hey. wrap it up. Thank you so much for we could talk about the African music. And I want to say a lot of what I'm saying about African music, I learned from the master, Yakub Adi. Mm. I don't want you to think I came up with this stuff. I'm, I'm stealing his stuff and telling it to you. <laughs> he no longer here to defend himself. So thank you, Maddie. It's great to see you. Great to see you, too. See All you right. next week. Be right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right, Maddie.